qui quindi i primi cinque quindi Borgatti, Jan, Baldini, Pagnacco e Poti si può portare il telecomando per Buongiorno a tutte e tutti, mi sentite? Sì, la sentiamo. Eh, buongiorno, io sono la quinta presentatrice e come vedete sì. sono online. C'è qualcuno che può scrollare le slide per me? Sì, glielo faccio io, glielo faccio io. Si ah, grazie, grazie mille professore. Ti immagini. Mettiamo un minuto e poi iniziamo. We'll wait just one second more and one minute more and then we start. Ok, let's start. Um, good morning to all of you. Very welcome to this quick response seminar number two on the legal issues which are emerging day after day in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, you, many of you probably have attended the previous one. The format was slightly different because on this part of the table there were basically professors or researchers or PhD candidates. This time we decided to do it slightly in a different manner and to invite on this part of the table uh, younger scholars, which are allievi ordinari or students of the Master in International Security Studies and PhD candidates, to make a very brief presentation on a certain number of current hot topics which are being dealt with. And the goal of this event is basically to share more information uh, about the legal aspects related to the conflict and looking to the emerging problems which are surfacing every day. I would like just to remind you that uh, this evening at six o'clock, there will be the uh, second moment in which the whole uh, Scuola Santana community will meet again to discuss the current events and there will be a few uh, comments by different resource persons and there will be as well the, the representative of the Italian government here in Pisa, the prefetto, who will uh, present us with the current uh, activities which are being carried out here locally in Pisa to support the uh, immigrants or people who are trying to flee from the conflict from Ukraine. Having said this, uh, the rules have been decided in a very democratic manner, more or less. Uh, each of the speakers has five minutes, and we would like to leave a little bit time as well for the discussion, and we hope to finish by a quarter to two, to allow those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to enjoy our Mensa, to go to the Mensa. So we will be very strict in assigning the time and asking everyone to respect the time. We start, the first presentation will be on the violations of international law, those which are emerging in the 
more recent days, the use of prohibited weapons and the case of the civilian combatants. And the two speakers will be Valentina Bogatti and Felix Jan from the Master of International Security Studies. You have the floor. Thank you, Professor. Um, okay, as the Professor said, we're going to talk about violations of uh, humanitarian law and especially about the case of civilian taking the arms and of prohibited weapons. So um, since what is going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine is uh, classified as an international armed conflict, the uh, re relevant legislation that applies in this case is international humanitarian law. So uh, humanitarian law is basically um, the, the law regulating armed conflict and it can be composed of different sources. So we have uh, treaty law, uh, for example, the most important one is the Vienna, the Geneva Convention, therefore, and uh, some specific treaties such that on um, uh, cluster bombs and also um, customary law can be a source. So I wanted to briefly stress some uh, basic concepts in broad terms of uh, international humanitarian law that are the protection of civilian and civilian infrastructure that cannot be a target of attacks. Um, the treatment of prisoners of war that must always respect their dignity. Um, some weapons are absolutely prohibited and cannot be used under any circumstance. And humanitarian relief cannot be blocked. So now we're going to look at the case of the citizen taking the arms, uh, whether they can be considered combatants or civilians. So um, to be considered um, a combatant, uh, there are some strict requirements. So, for example, you need to be identif uh, identified by a fixed sign. Uh, you have to respond to um, a responsible command chain and act in accordance to international humanitarian law. So it's not always easy to define the people taking part in the hostilities in Ukraine as combatants. Therefore, um, we can say that they can be classified as civilians that usually enjoy some a sort of civilian protection as we have already seen. And uh, um, however, by taking part in the hostilities, they lose the status of civilians for the time they take part in the hostility. But if they fall in the hands of the enemy, they have to be considered according to Article 45 of the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Convention as prisoners of war. Uh, in any case, the protocol also states that if it's not possible to distinguish between a civilian and another status, the person must always be considered as a civilian. Thank you. Now I'll leave the floor to my colleague, Felix. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina. Also welcome from my side. Um, now focusing on the case of Ukraine. Um, of course, there have been a variety of accusations from both sides. However, the evidence con uh, confirmed so far has pointed mostly towards the aggressor being Russia, uh, for example, attacking civilian areas um, in a variety of Ukrainian cities, as well as um, attacking directly civilian infrastructure, for example, um, such as kindergartens, hospitals, but also critical infrastructure. For example, it has been the case of the attacks against the TV tower in Kiev, as well as the nuclear power plant, power plant in uh, Zaporozhye which both can become, as Valentina just pointed out, can become military targets as long as they're being used as such. However, Russia has not um, shown or proven that these uh, facilities have been used in a military manner. Thus, these attacks can be uh, considered illegal by international law. Um, there has also been an interesting accusation um, towards Ukraine, uh, which regarding the filming of POWs, um, again, the, it, has been, it has been shown that although they have been treated humanly, they have been exposed to public curiosity, which, albeit maybe a minor, it's still a violation of international humanitarian law. Okay, switch. Thank you. Um, then we come towards the use of prohibited weapons in Ukraine. There has been one confirmed case, which is the use of cluster munitions uh, by Russia. Both Russia and Ukraine are not part of the convention against these. The use of these weapons, however, um, the way they work, the nature of these weapons makes them uh, impossible to be used accurately or indiscriminately, and thus they're illegal. 
And there's also been one case of mines being used against the humanitarian corridor. However, this has been not been, not been confirmed. And lastly, there's Russia has also brought um, thermobaric munitions to um, Ukraine, which are considered for causing unnecessary harms. Fortunately, however, they have not been used so far, and thus there is no violation so far. With that, thank you very much, and I yield back the floor to Mr. Likutri. Thanks to both. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. Now we are looking to the current situation in Ukraine. There are many rumors of many foreign presences there, which are not regular militias. And we are listening now to Alberto Baldini, who will try to address this specific issue. Thank you very much, Professor. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it is quite clear nowadays that uh, violations of international humanitarian law are happening in the conflict at hand here in Ukraine. And uh, considering the official sources only, the examples of this wrongdoing seems to be performed repeatedly by the official armed forces of uh, mostly the Russian Federation. And uh, however, a disquieting uh, uh, number of uh, pieces of news uh, regarding uh, uh, examples of uh, these violations performed by unofficial armed groups is actually growing. And uh, the matter is, uh, can a state be considered responsible for violations performed uh, by uh, such actors? We have uh, uh, sadly seen again multiple examples. I have uh, here chosen only two pictures, one per side. One is uh, really official and it actually it has actually been publicized by the official account of uh, Ukrainian armed forces. And it, is quite, it has been quite a surprise for the entire world. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. We will briefly examine the relevant international customary law and only then explore a very small selection of uh, case law. And so to better understand the various prerequisites uh, to find a state uh, responsible for such actions and such violations by irregular militias. So the main instrument of uh, international law on this topic are the draft articles on responsibility of states for international wrongful acts redacted by the International Law Commission in 2001. And we will focus mainly on the second chapter and precisely on Article 5 and Article 8, Article 8 uh, on, of these draft articles, which uh, uh, regards the, con the conduct of persons or entities exercising elements of governmental authority and uh, conducts uh, directed uh, or controlled by a state. The first uh, uh, article is uh, the more strict one and uh, regards uh, activities performed by parastatal entities, so uh, entities or group of, group of persons that actually um, might, uh, I go on the next slide, thank you very much, that might actually uh, perform government authorities and act in uh, a public uh, way, in, in a public domain. These violations to be, um, to be considered uh, uh, inside the realm of the responsibility of the state must be uh, must have been directly authorized by the state and there have, there must have been a direct uh, influence on every single activity that uh, has has been considered in fact the the state must have ordered the unlawful act to be performed article 8 is the second article and uh, is a more broad uh, um, more broad scope. In fact, uh, it uh, it has uh, instructions, directions, and control as uh, the main test test for uh, for responsibility. Again, these are understood to be a disjunctive. You don't need to have all of the th three tests uh, to be uh, upheld in every single case to uh, to be uh, to to have the state as responsible for every single violation. Uh, if we can go to the thank you very much. Uh, the next slide, uh, we will uh, see here the relevant international case law, uh, and we will understand that, that uh, responsibility uh, is understood in very, very strictly by states nowadays, and that uh, the instruction test, which is the more broad one, is not really applicable in this situation, or uh, is not really uh, demonstrable in this situation. In this situation, we must understand that we must speak of effective control and overall control mainly, which are uh, exposed in uh, 
the Nicaragua versus United States case and the Tadic case, uh, and have been revised uh, lastly in uh, the Bosnia genocide case, which uh, will uh, will not uh, really uh, we will not really speak about. The most uh, strict uh, requisite is effective control, which uh, directs that no uh, action can be performed with uh, any means of independence by the single army group and that uh, the state must be directing and uh, must have uh, the, this army group inside the uh, uh, organizational support zone and that uh, in a hierarchy so that uh, single activities must not cannot be uh, considered that uh, to be held for responsibility by the state since uh, there is not uh, a, a strict uh, um, responsibility in the area. We might speak about uh, the uh, the Mariupol uh, uh, situation, but we do not have the data on that area since it has been surrounded by uh, from for several days. The more broad scope of uh, the test of overall control test is uh, the one that we can hope to be uh, seeing used in this situation. And uh, I urge you to uh, study the Tadik case and uh, the International Court of Justice Bosnia genocide case, but which are not yet understood to be um, to be really uh, sedimentized in international law. And for example, uh, uh, Professor Cassesa said that the Bosnia genocide case has been a judicial massacre. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Baldini. Now, the next intervention will be on a very recent problem, namely the so-called IT army to be used during warfare. Agnacco, you have the floor. So I wanted to thank Professor De Guthrie, all participants and all attending, and very briefly move to uh, some uh, recent uh, developments in the present conflict in cyberspace. Uh, now, reported Russian activity in cyberspace is coherent with uh, traditional cyber warfare, warfare techniques, and uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, governments and Ukrainian organiz uh, organizations are uh, more than accustomed to this kind of threat. But what is uh, surprising and what is interesting is the nature of the response that has been quickly implemented by Ukraine. So, as we can see, uh, we have uh, no. I just <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Still, what? Uh, that's well, uh, I, I don't think we can see it anymore, but there was a tweet. Uh, and uh, it was uh, the announcement uh, of the creation of a group created uh, called uh, the IT Army of Ukraine uh, that entails uh, uh, public, uh, mostly offensive operations, uh, sanctioned or even incited uh, by a current member of the Ukrainian government against uh, its enemy in an active international armed conflict. And we see uh, a call to voluntary participation of foreigners which is facilitated by translation in English of some of the tasks that are uh, requested of these uh, volunteers. And these include uh, DDoS attacks, system intrusions or doxing, and they are all targeted towards uh, uh, media uh, organizations or uh, government officials, or in, in any case, uh, Russian targets. Uh, and somewhat cleverly, uh, those actions currently fall below the uh, threshold to be considered uh, cyber attacks in terms of effects. And uh, for uh, the definition of cyber attacks and all further uh, definitions, I will refer to the Tallinn Manual 2.0, which is a non-binding NATO-aligned scholarly work in absence of uh, uh, binding agreements and or uh, consolidated uh, uh, precedents. Uh, so for uh, uh, using Bello, uh, the Tallinn Manual posits that um, in fact, uh, IHL applies in cyberspace. Uh, and so we see that um, these, these new modes of conflict uh, allow for the participation of categories that might not have been uh, able to participate in uh, other forms of hostilities. So we see civilians, we see foreigners, and we see uh, people that are not currently located in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, can we uh, configure these civilian participants as participants to a uh, living mass and therefore protected under uh, IHL. Uh, and so I, I wanted to analyze uh, rule 88 of, uh, of the Chinese manual, which uh, tries to apply this concept of the uh, living mass in cyberspace. And I have highlighted uh, six uh, critical points. Uh, the first one is the issue of unoccupied territory. So it is not clear whether in this case it would exclude Ukrainian citizens 
participating in cyber hostilities while being physically in a space that is occupied by Russian forces, or whether, on the other hand, it would include um, foreigners, uh, international citizens that are uh, in uh, spaces unoccupied by the Russian forces and that are uh, fighting for uh, the Ukrainian side. Uh, for the second point, uh, it talks about cyber operations, so it does not exclude operations that are not that do not rise to the level of cyber attacks. We are on the in the clear there. Um, the spontaneous leap part is interesting because uh, clearly there are commands, and these commands are being transmitting uh, transmitted by uh, concretely uh, via, via a, um, a telegram channel, uh, but these can be equated to. Um, orders given over the wireless, and therefore uh, it wouldn't exclude uh, levy en masse, uh, per se. Um, the fourth point on the opportunity to organize, uh, clearly uh, uh, Ukrainians have had the opportunity to organize in regular um, kinetic forces, but uh, not so in uh, cyberspace, so it would still uh, remain a possibility. Um, it is impossible, however, to quantify the segment of the population that is participating to these hostilities, and it is especially hard to determine whether uh, international participants would count towards that quota. Uh, and finally, uh, it is unclear whether it is necessary that these activities must target the invading force per se, and not, uh, in general, the um, the, the enemy. So, uh, generally, uh, generally speaking, uh, Russian targets. So, I think there is a lot of space for further discussion on this topic, but I will leave the floor to Vincenzo. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think that you have raised a very innovative aspect, which probably will become more and more popular, and therefore this is a good argument which might need to be further analyzed and investigated. After having seen what happens in the, on the ground, now we see which are the reactions of the international community, starting with the reaction of the European Union and the sanctions decided against Russia. Pot, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor De Guthrie, and thank you everyone for being here or online today. I will address, as mentioned, the EU response to the invasion of Ukraine through the means of sanctions. As shown in the previous seminar, uh, imposing sanctions uh, is among uh, the rights of third parties uh, since the invasion of Ukraine amounts to a violation of an ergo omnes international norm. Restrictive measures or sanctions are an essential tool uh, of the EU's common foreign and security policy. Acting either within the UN framework or through a more autonomous regime, uh, the EU can issue uh, sanctions against governments of non-EU countries as well as uh, groups, entities, and individuals that are supporting the targeted policies of these governments. Being encompassed in, C in the CFSP under Article 29 of the TEU and Article 215 of the TFEU, uh, sanctions are decided by the Council, so at an intergovernmental level. Um, despite this, however, uh, both the Commission and the High Representative uh, play a decisive role in proposing measures and in monitoring uh, their implementation by member states and EU institutions. Um, can we change the... Thank you. Uh, the current round of sanctions on Russia is considered the fourth of a series starting in 2014 uh, after the illegal annexation of Crimea. And compared to the others, however, current sanctions hit harder on Russia. Uh, to such an extent that President Putin compared them to a declaration of war. The recognition of Russia uh, of the non-government controlled areas of Donetsk and Luhansk on 23rd February uh, triggered the first package of sanctions, um, which includes, for instance, travel bans and asset freeze on Duma members sustaining the recognition and against oligarchs and bank uh, banks deemed responsible for supporting it, and restriction on economic relations with two self-proclaimed republics uh, that amount to an import and an export ban from and to the EU. Measures belonging instead to the second package uh, were triggered by the actual military invasion of the following day. Here we have uh, asset raising measures against President Putin and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, uh, and other high officials of the Russian government. Uh, we have as well financial limitations cutting Russian access to capital markets intended to uh, raise the borrowing costs of Russia, raise inflation in the country, and eventually undermine the industrial base uh, of Russia. 
Uh, there has been also a ban on the export of oil refining, aviation, and dual-use technologies uh, towards Russia, obviously. Uh, all sector in which Moscow actually has, is highly dependent uh, on Europe. Uh, going to the third and last package of, of sanctions, sorry. Uh, this has been decided in coordination with uh, other Western partners by the EU and has been for sure not only the most innovative, but also uh, the most publicly debated. And among most significant sanctions belonging to this package, uh, we have a ban on overflight of EU territories uh, for all Russian aircrafts, a ban on all transactions with the Russian central bank, so including also foreign currency supply, a ban from SWIFT uh, for seven Russian banks. That is an unprecedented measure, basically cutting a Russian bank system off from the most diffused interbank transaction system. Uh, then we have also a suspension of broadcasting uh, in the EU uh, of state-owned media companies, uh, Russia Today and Sputnik. Uh, this has been issued in order to tackle the systematic international campaign of disinformation and manipulation put in place by Russia uh, in these years. Worryingly, this measure is um, not fully implemented in Italy, which is something that we have addressed as soon as possible. There are now uh, ongoing discussion among the EU and other partners such as the US on a future set of sanctions, uh, potentially including limitations to Russian maneuvers uh, in international organizations like the World Trade Organization. In any case, we are observing an unprecedented commitment, international commitment, even by private actors like, I don't know, Ferrari or McDonald's, uh, in order to, uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, and this is involving also historically neutral countries like Switzerland or reframing otherwise frozen relations like the one between the US and Venezuela. The key future action for the EU is considered to be a suspension of energy import from Russia as done just yesterday by the US. This shared commitment is fundamental to ensure the effectiveness of these sanctions, especially due to the presence of potential backdoors. These are among others, a consistent gold reserve uh, belonging to the Russian central bank, and potentially a transaction through cryptocurrencies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, now we are going to examine, from a legal point of view, one of the major consequences of the conflict, namely the fact that so many Ukrainians are trying to leave their countries. Um, Chiara, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor. So since the beginning of the war, more than 2 million people fled Ukraine and headed to neighboring countries, also including European countries, with some 99,000 people leaving Ukraine and headed to the Russian Federation. Uh, these people were um, residents uh, of the regions of Donetsk and Lugansk. To these numbers, we have, we have also to add more than 4.3 million internally displaced. And the European Union is expecting uh, up to 6.5 million people from Ukraine uh, arriving uh, in the EU. Given the current uh, situation, it's therefore uh, absolutely important to understand what kind of obligations do EU member states have under international refugee law. So first of all, all EU member states must comply with the principle of no refoulement. In, the context, in, in this context, it means that nobody coming from Ukraine can be removed, deported or expelled back to Ukraine where their life can be at serious risk. Asylum is a fundamental right of each individual, and it's also an international obligation for all EU member states, as enshrined in the milestone of uh, international refugee law, namely the 1951 Geneva Refugee Convention, and is also recognized in many EU treaties. To implement the uh, international obligation of asylum, the Common European Asylum System, the CIAS, lays out binding common standards, procedures, norms, definitions in order to qualify uh, international protection beneficiaries. And this also entails additional responsibilities for the states to respect, promote and protect their fundamental rights and um, uh, let them full access to services, facilities and opportunities. 
Given the current situation, however, it was uh, very much important to uh, provide immediate protection to everybody coming from Ukraine, therefore uh, skipping the individual uh, evaluation of an international protection claim. And this is why, for the very first time, the Council decided to activate the Temporary Protection Directive, which is an emergency mechanism to uh, provide immediate uh, and collective protection to um, everybody coming from the same ge geographical area and for the same reason. According to the Temporary Protection Directive, states must provide beneficiaries with a residence permit, access to labor market, education, uh, family reunification, and so on and so forth. It lasts one year and can be uh, renewed for additional two years. The problem with this definition is that it creates a stratification of categories who for sure will get temporary protection, those who can hope to get temporary protection and who uh, most, li uh, most likely will not receive uh, temporary protection. Indeed, in the first category, we can find Ukrainians with their families, beneficiaries of international protection in Ukraine and foreigners with a permanent residence permit. The decision uh, allows member states to discretionally extend temporary protection to foreigners uh, residing legally in Ukraine with other kinds of, um, uh, of permits and Ukrainians funding themselves in the European Union uh, when the war actually started. Who's out? international protection seekers in Ukraine and irregular migrants in Ukraine. And this, in my opinion, is uh, not compliant with the fact that protection uh, in case of conflict should be given um, with uh, no discrimination to nationality and um, with no discrimination regarding the regularity or irregularity of the status. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chiara. You have contributed to shed some light on a very sensitive issue. And probably we will have to deal with this in the future days and weeks, even more. As you may know, in this very unique situation, there have been a certain number of states and international organizations who decided to provide arms to, to Ukraine. And there are quite a lot of political and legal implications. We will examine them in the two next uh, presentations. The first one will be devoted on international consequences and the regime, and the second one on the domestic situation in Italy. Francesco Paolo Levantino, you have the floor for the first part. Thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll try to briefly analyze the status of all those states that are indeed providing uh, weapons and ammunition to Ukraine in the context of the conflict with the Russian Federation. So we'll start with the concept of neutrality, which doesn't have a specific definition under international law. However, by analyzing the 1907 uh, a convention on rights and duties of uh, neutral uh, powers, we can grasp the essence of this uh, concept, which entails on the one hand rights, the main of which is the protection of the territory of a neutral uh, state. So the territory of a neutral state is defined as inviolable as far as uh, neutral states respect some obligations, including the abstention from providing belligerents with certain categories of goods, including weapons and ammunition. The original function of this status, of course, is contributing to stability and avoiding that more and more uh, states uh, can be involved into uh, a conflict. For what concerns the acquisition of the status, please, Professor, uh, we uh, we can uh, the, uh, state can acquire this status at the outbreak of an armed conflict through a specific declaration or unequivocal acts. In a similar manner, the status is lost either at the end of the armed conflict or when the neutral state becomes a party to the conflict. So precisely this point gives us the chance to understand that. A breach of the law of neutrality it doesn't imply that the state automatically becomes a party to uh, the conflict. Uh, so, if not a neutral state, those states provided uh, weapons will be qualified in another manner, perhaps through the uh, framework of the concept of non belligerency. So, no belligerency uh, is uh, not qualified under international 
are low. We don't have any reference either in uh, nor in uh, treaty law. Uh, nor in uh, customer international law. However, we have some references in state practice and in their interpretation by relevant scholar. However, if we give a look at some provisions under treaty law, for instance, those in the slides, we can understand the importance of somehow qualifying all those states which in the context of, of a conflict are neither belligerent uh, uh, nor uh, neutral. And in this context, those formulations are uh, used to clarify that provisions of fundamental importance are to be applied to any state not participating in the conflict independently of any controversy on the status of uh, neutrality. So we can define neutrality, uh, please as a not codified intermediate status standing between neutrality and uh, belligerency, which allows to deviate from the strict rules of the eight conventions on the status of neutrality. So in this case, non-belligerent states can provide supplies, including weapons, to uh, parties of the conflict. However, as far as they don't get involved into the into the conflict, for instance, by participating with an armed intervention at the side of one of the belligerents, or by putting their territory at the disposal of a party to the conflict for a direct attack. So we can see that here the sanction is allowing to a state to deviate from the strict rules of the law of neutrality while not being involved into the uh, conflict bearing the, the consequences. So at this point, um, which are the consequences of the status of non-belligerency? Uh, so, as I see it, under certain conditions, both a single violation of the law of neutrality and the status of non-belligerency are lawful situation, which, however, can give rise to uh, the, adopt the adoption of countermeasures by the affected belligerent. Uh, and on the other side can give rise to responsibility of the state providing the weapons under some sector specific rules. In this case, I just want to specify that the possible responsibility is not for the act per se of providing weapons to a belligerent, but for the following use, which is done of those weapons, for instance, the commission of uh, war crimes. So thank you for the attention and now leave the flow to uh, Giulia Santini, who will analyze this topic from a slightly different angle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gino. Thank you all. I will be uh, dealing with the uh, profiles of domestic law in sending weapons to Ukraine. Among other measures adopted in reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Italian Council of Ministers, like many other Western governments, has resolved to send lethal weapons to support the needs of the attacked nation. With the Decreto Legge No. 16 of February 28, the legal instrument that sets the details of the operation was identified in a decree of the Minister of Defence to be adopted in concert with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Economy and Finance. The Decreto Legge expressly derogates from the current legislation on arms, export, import and transit as per Legge No. 185 of 1995 and Codice dell'Ordinamento Militare. In fact, the ordinary rules don't, not, don't contemplate the free transfer of armaments by the Ministry of Defense, even for the benefit of countries facing an aggression, especially when there are no guarantees on the destination of the materials. While the constitutional requisite or necessity and urgency will justify the enactment of the Decreto Legge seems self-evident in the light of the events, it is worth noting that the preamble of the Act recalls Articles 3 and 4 of the North Atlantic Treaty. This reference could be questionable insofar as these provisions refer to consultation and mutual assistance between the parties for defensive purposes and not to actions aimed at external countries. Change, please. I will consider the consistency of the Decreto Legge as regards the defense policy model designed by the Constitution. In fact, even if the intervention were legitimate from the point of view of the international law, it would be necessary to verify its consistency with the principle of domestic law. The Article 11 of 1948 Constitution, in line with the principles of the Brian Taylor Pact and the UN Charter, expressly repudiates war as means of offense and dispute resolution, but does not abdicate 
use of the armed force to the purposes related to national defense. The constitutional model has been described by Antonio Cassese as based on four pillars. Pacifism, the guarantee of parliament's involvement in military policy decisions, the opening to operation conducted under the coordination of international organization with the aim of consolidating peace and stability, which is intended to be a form of solidarity between nations. The self-defense reaction and peacekeeping operation conducted with the consent of the states are therefore fully legitimate. The Italian legal system, according to the Article 10 of the Constitution, um, provides that the customary international rules automatically have constitutional value. So Article 11 must be interpreted on this basis. Any form of illegitimate use of force under international law and any armed aid to an aggressor or colonial country must certainly be considered prohibited. Instead, as regards other forms of intervention, law scholars are divided. If the first proposition of Article 11 were to be considered merely reproductive of the rule of customary law, the operation of peace enforcement and armed support to an attacked country should be considered legitimate, as per Ronzitti and Cerotto. But in this case, the rule would seem inutilitary data in the light of Article 10. To give it a more pregnant meaning, it should be interpreted as stating a stricter form of self-restraint planning all non-peaceful foreign policy actions, as per Allegretti, Azzariti and Villone. For sure, like any other legal interpretation issue, fundamentally, it is an axiological question, the resolution of which depends on the government's political choices. Okay. Certainly, the parliament could have its say, since the transfer of weapons requires the acquisition of a prior atto di indirizzo by the houses, mozione, risoluzione, or ordine del giorno, similar to what is required for the deploy of the armed forces abroad. But the houses exercise a form of self restraining expressing themselves in broad and quite vague terms, substantially reproducing the literal provisions of the decreto legge. Nor it would be easy to access the judicial review. In fact, to address the constitutional court, a legislative act must be relevant in a common law suite, and this is almost impossible in the case of a law aimed at a foreign policy issue. If we also consider the fact that the content of the ministerial decrees is removed from the control of public opinion as they have been classified, it's quite evident that despite the system of constitutional guarantees, military affairs are still characterized by a dimension of arcanum imperi. The norms that regulate them are ultimately political acts which remain free from external controls as they do not directly interfere with the rights of citizens. Thank you. Thank you for this focus on the Italian legal system and the compatibility with the decision between the decisions taken and our internal international obligations. Now, the following presentation will be on the potential role to be carried out by the International Criminal Court. As you know, there are quite a lot of activities ongoing. Uh, Antonella Benedetta from the Master of International Security Studies, we have the floor. Uh, thanks, first of all, to Professor De Guthri, who organized the seminar, and to all my colleagues who intervened today. Today, I will briefly talk about the limited capacity of the International Criminal Court to exert jurisdiction in the Ukrainian case, and what the member states of the Statue of Rome can do. Italy is among the 39 countries that Wednesday, the 2nd of March, solicited the International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan to start a referral under Article 14 of the Statute of Rome of 1998 for possible uh, war crime committed in Ukraine by Russia from the day of the start of the conflict, so the 24th of February. Despite the immediate, already immediately uh, day after of the conflict, the 25th of February, the prosecutor had already declared in his statement the same intention of the states. The receipt of a, a referral advanced by a large group of states represents a strong signal for the international community and the court, which can contribute to invoke the respect of international humanitarian law. The action of international criminal, uh, criminal court evolves around three different scenarios. The first cannot be pursued since the, since the action of the court uh, prosecutor is subjected uh, to a resolution voted by the United Nations Security Council, valid with the positive vote of all uh, big five. And we know that we will have always the negative vote of the Russian Federation. Uh, the second scenario, uh, see the court prosecutor that can also act by its own initiative, the so-called proprio motu. In this case, uh, uh, the timing for the procedure is longer, since the prosecutor must receive approval uh, from judges to open formal, in formal investigation after completing the preliminary examination. 
Instead, the, uh, the fact that member states asked for the referral opened for a different, complete th third scenario, since the timing of international criminal justice will significantly be reduced. The prosecutor doesn't need to get the approval of the, co of the court judges for opening an investigation. Still, he can speed up the process in collecting, storing, and analyzing the evidence. Among those called to respond to the accusation could appear the material perpetrators, so uh, from the civil and milit military superiors, the high highest political figures, including President Putin. In conclusion, we still don't know how the scenario will evolve. If the accusation of crime against humanity, war crime and genocide by numerous groups of states could facilitate or impede the peace process, above all now during the timid negotiation phase we are living. Despite, accordi uh, despite according to the Article 15 bis, it's not possible to persecute Putin or, in, or any other on the crime and aggression, the investigation for the first three, uh, serious crime are, are still possible. The potential consequence of an arrest warrant, warrant for Putin or other authorities, so from those who give the order to those who, who execute, will impede from the, from the movement in the 120. 23 member states of the statue and therefore limiting their role in the international scenario. We all hope that the activation of the court could work as a deterrence to invite Russia and other states which support it, for example Belarus, to respect the international humanitarian law since there is a mounting evidence that Russia is committing all new suspected war crime beyond the one committed in 2014. Thank you. Panella for having presented to us the challenges of the facing international criminal court, political and legal. The next intervention is aimed to give to us an answer. Is it possible to kick out the Russia from the UN? Fabio Sapino, you have the floor. So thank you all. Uh, one of the possibility that has emerged in these days is the uh, possibility to kick out Russia from the UN. This issue is clearly problematic since uh, in the short history of the United Nations, no state was never expelled. It was tried to do so with South Africa in 1974 due to its apartheid policies. But we have a big difference between South Africa and Russia because Russia is not a simple member of the United Nations, but also a member of the Security Council. So as we will see in the next slide, we cannot activate Article 6 uh, not only because Russia is a member, but because it has main allies such as China, who never let the expulsion of Russia, uh, both from the Security Council and uh, from the General Assembly. The main problem, and can be analyzed and struggle for the Russian position, is the question of succession of state. So if it's legally binding, the succession from the Soviet Union to the federal, uh, the, the current Russia. No state made any objection when Boris Yeltsin uh, took the former Soviet Union seat at the Security Council meeting. But we have to consider that the Vienna Convention on Succession of State uh, was not into force until 1996. And this uh, first Yeltsin Council was in 1991. So the only decision that we can consider is the UN Legal Committee decision of 1947 that clearly states that when a state uh, ends its uh, international recognition, and its position among other states uh, loses all the rights and obligation as a member of the United Nations. So we can only see a comparison between the Russian position and other states in the history. Uh, we had no problem when there were simple and mere name and government change as for Zaire that became Congo or such as Egypt from a monarchy to a republic after a coup. But it's interesting how was dealt the situation with other dissolution of state, such as for Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. The new entities formed after the dissolution of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia uh, necessitated uh, the normal procedure to be admitted uh, in the United Nations and goes for Croatia and so on. So why the Russian Federation did not have the same path as Serbia, as uh, Macedonia and so on. But a key issue may be the not, it's not defining as a succession between the Republic of China, the nationalist led government, and the People Republic of China. In this case, the states could uh, um, overlap the role of the uh, Security Council by uh, a resolution 
that binded also the Security Council because it was not intended to prove a succession between the nationalist government to the communist one, but only to uh, a credential matter. So who has the right to represent as an ambassador, as a government, uh, the entity denominated as China? So we'll never know in the future if, if we have a split of Russian governmental position, this way can be maybe used. Thank you all. Thank you, Sapino. I think that this is another issue which deserves additional investigation because, I mean, it never happened, but there might be uh, possibilities. I mean, going a little bit more into the details of really uh, moving in the direction of expelling the Russia from the United Nations. Having seen in any case the problems, which are the challenges which will be faced by the International Criminal Court, what we are going to do now is to examine if there are alternative ways of bringing those responsible of the armed aggression to Ukraine, for example, through the creation of independent tribunals or investi investigation mechanism to, for violations of human rights. Julia Bosi, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Julia Bosi and I'm a PhD candidate in human rights and global politics. So what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that on the 4th of March, a few days ago, the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a resolution establishing an independent international commission of inquiry to investigate violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law in the context of the war in Ukraine. So first of all, we're going to see what a commission of inquiry is. Second, we are going to see uh, the resolution that specifically established the uh, Commission of Inquiry for the situation in Ukraine. And finally, we will see how this interacts with other international law tools that are being used or proposed to address and, uh, the human rights and international humanitarian law violations and ensure accountability. So first of all, what is a Commission of Inquiry? When we talk about commissions of inquiry, we refer to a variety of temporary bodies. So first of all, they are bodies with a limited duration in time that are non-judicial in nature. So we're not talking about courts or judges or legally binding decision. They are non-judicial uh, body that are established either by an intergovernmental body or the secretary general or the high commissioner for human rights. So this means that different bodies can create commissions of inquiry. This include, for example, General Assembly or the Security Council. In our case, the case for this commissions of inquiry on Ukraine, the body that establishes it, it's the UN Human Rights Council. And what is the task? The task is to investigate allegations of violations of international law, including human rights, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and then make recommendation for corrective action based on the factual and legal findings. So first of all, they investigate both from a legal and factual point of view. And after that, they uh, uh, try to uh, issue recommendations, for example, on how to address violations and to provide uh, access to justice, for example, to victims. So the resolution we are talking about, uh, uh, it's again a resolution of the Human Rights Council. I'm sure you know, but the Human Rights Council is an intergovernmental body inside the United Nations, which is composed of 47 member states that are elected by the United Nations General Assembly and the aim is to promote and protect human rights. So this International Commission of Inquiry that is going to be established is going to be composed of three independent experts and the initial duration is going to be a one year. Uh, the mandate of these commissions of inquiry, because you have to know that commissions of inquiry, they are all the same aim to ensure accountability, but they all have different specific mandates according to the situation. In the case of Ukraine, uh, the mandate is going to be to investigate all alleged violations of international law and related crimes in the context, again, of the Russian Federation aggression against Ukraine to establish the facts, circumstances and root causes of any such violation. And finally, as we said, to make recommendation in particular on accountability measures. This resolution does not only create no, this is for the next speaker. 
this resolution does not only create uh, an international commission of inquiry, but also, for example, it condemns Russia's actions in Ukraine, asks for the withdrawal of Russian troops from the Ukraine, asks for ensuring humanitarian access. And it was adopted with 32 votes um, in favor, 13 abstention, and to uh, vote against. The votes against were the one of, of course, Russia Federation and Eritrea. And uh, to conclude, the, it, this is not the only international law tool that has been adopted so far to ensure accountability. Uh, we know that uh, Ukraine has brought proceeding before the International Court of Justice person to the Genocide Convention, but also the International Criminal Court Prosecutor as open investigation. And finally, uh, interestingly, some academics, including, for example, very famous international law professor Dapa Kande, has proposed the creation of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say that it's going to be interesting to see, for example, how the findings of the Commission of Inquiry will be used by these other judicial proceedings. But also, it's going to be interesting to see how this Commission of Inquiry uh, will work if it will have, for example, access to the Ukrainian territory and how the Russian Federation will deal with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. And I think that you opened the way for the last presentation, which will be offered by Alan Amadio, and he will try to understand if we can consider putting a criminal and if there is a need to find possible alternative international tribunals. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor De Gucci, for this opportunity and also to my colleagues for the very interesting reflections. I will try to focus a little bit more on the role of international criminal law in addressing this crisis and in particular on the crime of aggression. Uh, we have already seen that the International Criminal Court is investigating um, the crisis and also the possible commission of uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even possible conducts of genocide in Ukraine. But there is still one absent amongst the core crimes, and it is the crime of aggression. So why should we prosecute also the crime of aggression? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, first, uh, this is a so-called leadership crime. So it is a crime that has to be committed by those who, are, who have an effective control over the political and military action of a state. So this could be the crime that could be more straightforwardly linked directly to an individual responsibility of the Russian leadership and also of President Putin himself as the president of the Russian Federation and also as the commander in chief of the Russian army. Uh, secondly, it is key uh, to fully recognize peace as a central value in international community because differently from other general violations uh, of the prohibition of the use of force, in this case, we have the criminal the criminal and individual responsibility of some actors. And differently from other core crimes, in this case, we could prosecute the decision itself to wage war, to wage war against Ukraine, not only how the war, the war is being conducted. Um, and lastly, uh, it would complement some gaps left behind by the prosecution of other core crimes, in particular, the protection of the right to life of uh, Ukrainian combatants and also of collateral civilians who don't fall under the war crimes. But um, where can we prosecute the crime of aggression? There are many possibilities. The ICC is not one of them, and we have already seen it. Uh, so we could look at national courts exercising their universal jurisdiction or at new international tribunals created ad hoc for this situation. Uh, but national courts could face some major problems, some major challenges, in particular, the principle of non-retroactivity in criminal matters so that could prohibit countries like Italy that uh, have not yet codified both the principle of uh, the universal jurisdiction and the crime of aggression. And uh, also a major problem would be that of immunities, in particular, the immunities ratione persone, 
uh, for the head of state, so Vladimir Putin, and uh, the ministers for foreign affairs, so Lavrov, for example. This is still not very clear under international law, but it seems also looking at the ICJ decision of 2002 that if you have a national court exercising universal jurisdiction, it, it could face the problem of immunities. Uh, this problem could be overco uh, overcome by a new international tribunal that could also have more uh, legitimacy and also applicate international law under which uh, aggression is a crime, uh, also under co international customary law. Uh, so how can we create a new international tribunal? Well, this is obviously the most um, difficult part and the most de uh, debatable part, but I've just put forward some ideas. Uh, obviously, we cannot look at the Security Council resolution as uh, we had with the ad hoc tribunals of the 90s, uh, but maybe we could look at the new role of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, so maybe a treaty between the UN and Ukraine itself or maybe also at the treaty between states outside the United Nations framework, recalling what the Allied powers did during and after the Second World War with the London Charter. Or maybe we could look at a more regionalized approach to this crisis, uh, maybe building a new uh, special section for international criminal law inside the European Court of Human Rights, recalling what the African Union tried to do with the Malabo Protocol, or uh, maybe an agreement at the Council of Europe uh, level, creating a special jurisdiction in Ukraine or in another uh, country member to the organization, uh, recalling what uh, the African Union and Senegal did to prosecute the uh, dictator of Chad. Um, just remember that uh, Russia is still a part to Council of Europe, uh, but even if suspended. So these are my ideas and thank you very much. Thank you very much for this proposal, which look very innovative. Um, well, let me start saying thanks to all those who have contributed to this session. Uh, very appreciated, especially because there was not much time to prepare yourself. Very special thanks as well for having contributed to prepare the slides. Uh, now we have still, if you want, a couple of minutes for questions and answers. If there is anybody or comments, if there is anybody who would like to add a question or make a comment to what your colleagues have said so far, feel free to raise the hand. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I have maybe a question directly um, for uh, Vincenzo Poti. And my question is, uh, since we are currently observing that this type of sanction seems to not have a clear uh, purpose to immediately end the world, I have two questions. Uh, what are the consequences of this target sanction on the Russian population in the future? And when the European Union try to deliver these uh, packages of sanction, is it taking also in consideration the possible devastating impact on civilians? Thank you. Thank you for the question. We collect the questions and then we give the floor for the answers. Are there any other comment or question? No other comments, no any questions? I've seen somebody raising a hand. Okay, please. I'm not sure if it's if there are comments or requests of the floor from those who are attending online, please just yes. switch on the mm. microphone. Yes, uh, I would like to make a question to Chiara Shissa uh, if uh, she knows uh, how many uh, irregular migrants. Uh, um, are in Ukraine right now. So to understand how many uh, irregular migrants remains are outside of uh, the protection of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. 
No, you have to come here because those who are attending from online, they will not be able. Hi, I have a question for Vincenzo. Um, um, what could be the effect of these economic sanctions and the one that will co come on the population of Europe and uh, the Russian citizens? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, hey, this is not the case. I had one question specifically to Fabio Sapino uh, concerning the possibility to kick out Russia from the United Nations. You have identified clearly that there is an article according to which the procedure is that on the basis of the proposal of the Security Council and the decision taken by the General Assembly. Now, my question to you is, is this impossible? Uh, isn't this a so-called procedural matter for which you don't need, or you the veto right does not exist, or there is the obligation of abstention by the uh, relevant permanent member? Okay, yes, please, Chiara De Antoniazzi. Yes, because I, I have a follow up questions regarding the last one. So what are your views about uh, the use of the credentials process in this respect? Do you think it can be used as a way to sidestep this problem and the issue that Professor Bittagutri was raising? Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Anybody else? This is the last opportunity to ask questions, to provide comments. Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much for all of you. Your presentation was very nice and I learned a lot. Uh, my question is when it comes to just delivering or sending uh, armies or some weapons to uh, Ukraine, and if there is some contradiction between the national law and the international law, which outweighs? This is one, one question. And the other is in relation to the news, which says that today Poland was just commenting about deploying Russian MiG-29, I think, in in, uh, in American base in Poland. What is the implication, the legal implication and uh, the political implication? Because I have read that there is some serious uh, conflict is going on. Maybe this is my personal opinion. Some people even think that Third World War is coming. I don't know how can we reflect on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope I hope I'm clear. You hope that I hope I am clear. Clear. No problem. Clear. Okay. Anybody else wishing the floor? Okay, let's start with the question. I think there are two questions to party. The question of the impact of the sanctions and the question of the consequences for both civil society in Europe and in Russia. Yeah, thank you for the questions, first of all. Uh well. I think this is more a political problem than a legal problem to a certain extent, because from a legal point of view, sanctions are only intended to restore the status quo. But this is a very broad definition, I have to admit, but also because it's uh, unlikely that in a short term, the war will be stopped by sanctions. But on the other side, uh, there are for sure, they constitute for sure a constraint to Russian ability to prosecute the attack uh, because you need uh, resources uh, to put in place such an invasion and uh, also to reduce their bargaining power uh, during negotiations. Well, the consequences. There are consequences, all, all, of course, for both population, Russian and European one. Uh, but I mean, uh, I think that especially EU sanctions are always part of a broader and coherent policy approach, which is very comprehensive and that, and that and takes also into account the needs of the population. So I'm confident that the EU will um, shape, will, yeah, will, ref, will frame a future sanctions if needed uh, in a proper manner. And I mean, for the European population, we are suffering minor consequences uh, if we compare them with what, what, what's happening 
And uh, I mean, these sanctions are completely legal. This is the first point. And they're just raising our cost of living uh, or pushing us to, towards a green transition. So I think that we can also see opportunities in the problems they're creating. Thank you. Thank you. The second question was to Chiara Shissa on numbers on Ill irregular migrants currently in Ukraine and trying to get out. Chiara? Thank you, Professor, and thanks also to John Maria for uh, his question. Well, actually, if we um, look at the total number of people potentially excluded by temporary protection, the number is quite large. In fact, according to IOM, currently in Ukraine, there are between 37 and 61,000 um, irregular migrants. To these, we have to add also 2,300 uh, 2, um, 2, uh, international protection seekers currently in Ukraine. These come from um, Afghanistan, Syria, and the Russian Federation itself. So this is why, according to me, um, this kind of decision creates some tensions between with um, international refugee law, which again requires that protection must be given uh, regardless of nationality and the regularity or the irregularity of uh, one's status. Of course, these people uh, potentially excluded from temporary protection could, of course, pro um, access international protection. But again, if we look at the places available, for instance, in Italy for international protection seekers, we can see that the Italian government has provided uh, so far 16,000 places for uh, people um, fleeing Ukraine. However, the number of people arriving in Italy fleeing uh, Ukraine are um, 250,000. So there is a, a strong disproportionality between the uh, people coming and uh, the number of places available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. The following two questions were to Sapino, namely the possibility to use the relevant articles in the UN Charter to kick out a member who is persistently violating the UN, or and to use the credentials, not to recognize the credentials of the Ukrainians. The or of the Russians. Yeah. Know. Thank you for both the questions. Are really interesting. Starting from the first one by Professor De Guthri, it's a, a great zone of the the charter, I think, because if we look to the historical precedent, we have only one that was the uh, contrariety to the Soviet Union to the presence of a member. Uh, of the nationalist uh, uh, China government, but it was not used a uh, veto power, but only the absence of the Russian representative uh, in that uh, reunion of the uh, Security Council. So this is a matter that I said uh, previously, it's a gray area because there's the possibility to a kind of double veto because first they have to decide whether it's not a uh, procedural matter, so it can be a first opposition, and then a uh, merit be um, uh, veto in the merit. So uh, after the decision of what can be considered the procedure of admission or uh, expulsion of a member from the, um, the United Nation, uh, Russia or China or its allies can veto for a second time this position. How about the um, credential uh, way to expel Russia? Um, it can be considered for sure, but it, I think that depends on how the situation in Russia will uh, develop in case of a, a real big split as it was for uh, the nationalist China and the communist-led government in Beijing. So with only the opposition, and I think it's politically impossible to obtain, but who knows, uh, only uh, with withdrawing the credential to the Russian ambassadors to the UN and recognize maybe uh, not de facto government uh, would be a very risky way to uh, overcome the problem and but in lawful condition. Thank you, Sapino. And the last two questions were related to the hot issue of armed delivery to Ukraine and in one part on the consistency in between national law and international obligations and the other and the decision of the Netherlands, I mean, to offer more significant uh, contributions in arms. I don't know if Francesco or Paolo Levantino would like to answer. 
okay? And then I don't know if you would like to answer. Okay, sure. Okay, so uh, to answer this question, I think it's very relevant to take into account which kind of weapons are going to be uh, provided. Because, of course, if those are uh, defensive weapons, uh, the risk uh, for the providing state of being involved and to bear responsibility for those acts is uh, less direct and less immediate and there's less risk for the providing state. However, we have to take into account that, for instance, for what concerns the status of neutrality or non-belligerency, uh, for instance, we can take into account the fact that, let's say, the EU is providing weapons to uh, Ukraine, that NATO perhaps may be involved in uh, bringing those weapons to Ukraine from the EU, then what happens if Russia adopts countermeasures, for instance, uh, shutting down an airplane of NATO bringing uh, supplies from the EU, which falls down within the territory of Poland, let's say. So I think that all these are factors that might be taken into account when we assess the risk of providing weapons uh, to a uh, belief state. So this is my take on this. Thank you. I hope you're happy with the first part of the answer. Another question of the compatibility of domestic law with international obligations. Yes, accord, according to the Italian Constitutional Court, the international customary law prevails over constitutional norms unless international norms are recognized violating the so-called principi supremi dell'ordinamento, sovereign principles of the legal order, and the control is uh, um, a task for the constitutional court itself. But uh, in this case, I think that there is no uh, such a contrast because international law sets uh, um, so, a sort of permissive rules uh, and uh, the question is if the domestic law um, provides uh, bans and uh, a stricter self-restraint uh, on the use of force. So I don't think that that's the case. And in the case of a contrast, I don't think that the um, strength of the pacifist principle could be led the, the, the Constitutional Court to uh, make the constitutional norms prevail. That is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Giulio. Um, once more, thanks to all of you who have contributed to this session. We have been able to respect very strictly the time limits which we have agreed on. Thank you very much for all of you who have attended here in presence or uh, online. Uh, just for your information, as you may know, we have launched here from the school uh, an appeal uh, or uh, we have submitted a certain number of proposals, technical proposal to the Italian government, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate of what could be done, I mean, to reinforce our presence and our activities to face against the illegal invasion of Ukraine. And we are very happy that uh, the President of the Senate decided to be interested to meet those who have prepared this document and we will meet him here at the Scuola tomorrow for 45 minutes in order to illustrate him our ideas and our proposal, which are technical proposals so that he can then make a good assessment if and which of these proposals could be transformed into very practical measures to be decided by the, the Senate. I think that it is a small but i think interesting signal of what we can do as a university as a reserve center i mean to try to influence the political decisions uh, in italy facing this very uh, complicated situation having said this thanks a lot to all of you for your participation i wish you all the best for the remaining part of the day and for the coming weeks all the best thank you Grazie a voi. Grazie a voi. Complimenti.